But now there's one other class of objects called Kuiper Belt objects, um, sometimes also called trans-Neptunian objects. So sometimes we call them KBOs, sometimes TNOs. Um, I like Kuiper Belt objects because that's where they live. They live in the Kuiper Belt. It's basically similar to the asteroid belt, but it's farther out in the solar system. And because it's farther away from the sun, the composition tends to be icier rather than rockier. So the KBOs um, consist, again, of rock and ice in different mixtures. Um, here are a bunch of different densities of some famous Kuiper Belt objects. And as you can see, they're kind of all over the board. So there, there's quite a bit of variation there based on whether something is more rocky, like Eris, or more icy, such as perhaps uh, Sela here. And some of these must also be relatively fluffy in nature and contain a bunch of empty space because they have low densities. Some of these Kuiper Belt objects are dwarf planets. So these four, um, Haumea, Makemake, Eris, and Pluto, those are all classified as dwarf planets. So the, the Kuiper Belt, like I mentioned, is out farther away from the sun than the asteroid belt. They are outside of Neptune's orbit, and that's why they're sometimes called trans-Neptunian objects, because their orbit can take them outside and inside of Neptune's orbit. OK, so question for you. These objects are really far away from Earth. Uh, we mentioned in the pre-class questions that they haven't been studied until recently. And the primary reason for that is they don't reflect very much light because they're really far from the sun. So they don't receive much light to reflect back to Earth. So your detectors have to be really good if you're going to pick them up. Some of them have been explored by New Horizons, but that's the, so far the only mission that has explored the Kuiper Belt. So if they're so hard to study, then how can we find their mass? All right, so the most solid way to calculate the KBO's mass would be to measure the orbital period of a moon. Um, so for those of you who chose number two, um, yes, orbital periods are helpful, but let's return to our um, Kepler's third law, Newton's version. So the modified version of Kepler's third law the mass that we calculate using Kepler's modified third law is the combined mass of the mass at the center of the orbit and the orbiting mass. So if you look at the Kuiper Belt objects, the KBO orbit around the sun, the mass that you would be calculating would be the mass of the sun. Remember when we did the mass of Saturn lab, we were looking at the orbit of Titan, but that gave us the mass of Saturn. And so for that reason, if you want to measure the mass of the Kuiper Belt object, then you have to measure the mass of its moon. That is the best way to get a KBO's mass. But I like that so many of you um, were tempted by my made up answer about albedo. Okay, I'm just gonna finish talking about Kuiper Belt objects, Pluto and Charon here. I know that we're a little bit over time and should take a break soon, but I think let's just finish the thoughts here. So we kind of missed out talking about Pluto and Charon this week, but they fit in here just fine because Pluto is a Kuiper Belt object. It's a very small mass object and small in size as well in radius. Its density is about 1.9 grams per centimeter cubed. So as you can tell, fairly, um, less rocky than most of the other terrestrial planets, which is why we wouldn't classify it as a terrestrial planet anymore. It has a long orbital period because of its large semi-major axis. It's far from the sun, therefore orbits very slowly. And as you can see, it has a pretty extreme orbital tilt and rotates around every six days. So when we look at Pluto and Charon, they have very similar diameters. Um, Charon's about half the size of Pluto. Um, for comparison, our moon is about a fourth of the size of Earth. And Pluto and Charon are in a double tidal lock, meaning that as they orbit their common center of mass, the same face of them is always facing each other. They're like, it's as if they're holding hands and swirling around in a, you know, twirling around 
like you do playing with a child on the in a park or something. Um, so this double tidal lock, I think that's pretty radical. When we look at Pluto's surface, it doesn't have very many craters. Um, and so it has an old surface, but the problem is that just that far away, there's not very many impactors. The Kuiper belt isn't very densely packed. So Pluto, even though it's been around for a long time, simply hasn't had a lot of time to sustain impacts because it hasn't had many impactors to impact. There's an area called the Tamba Regio uh, that's shaped like a heart. And it is light in color compared to the rest of Pluto's surface. Um, about half of it is an old crater that's been filled in with a glacier made of frozen nitrogen. Um, and the mountains on uh, Titan are also made of water ice, just like Pluto's mountains. So out here in the outer solar system, ice plays the same role as rock does in the terrestrial worlds. <laughs> 